Welcome back to Exploring the New Testament. Today we want to talk about how to read the book of Acts. The book of Acts is such an exciting book. There's so much drama and action in the book. And, um, and it's exciting too because we today as Christians, as, as the Church of Jesus Christ, are engaged in the same mission that we read about in the book of Acts, to go into all the world, uh, to go to the ends of the earth as witnesses to Jesus Christ. But at the same time, many of the events recorded in the book of Acts are meant to be unique. It's a transitional time uh, when all the blessings of the new covenant are just beginning to be realized. The Holy Spirit is poured out on Christians for the first time. Churches are established for the first time. Samaritans and Gentiles are included in God's people for the first time. And so there are similarities and differences between our own day and between the book of Acts. And so one of the challenges of reading the book of Acts is to answer the question of the things that I'm reading about in this book what was unique to that transitional period in salvation history? And uh, what is normal for all places at all times? For example, uh, should we only baptize believers, which is what we see in the book of Acts, or should we baptize uh, our children, our, our infants, like many churches do today? Uh, is the example of the book of Acts uh, an example that that is a mandate for how church ought to be done? Or is it just the example of what we see in that transitional period, and then today we're in a different kind of epoch of history? Similarly, should we um, supernaturally speak in other languages uh, or speak in tongues, as we see happening in the book of Acts? Uh, or was that unique to that part of salvation history? Should missionaries today adopt strategies and practices that we see in the Apostle Paul, or was that unique? So these are some of the challenges that we wrestle with when we read the book of Acts. And uh, I want to give you um, some, some tips for reading the book of Acts. These aren't going to solve all of those debates that I just mentioned but I think they will give us kind of a, a shared place to, to begin thinking about. So the first thing to notice is that Luke is writing history. That's the main purpose of Luke, to write the history of how the gospel advanced from Jerusalem all the way to the capital city of Rome. And while in that history of the early churches, we're going to learn a lot about uh, what churches should do and what churches should be. It's important to remember that Luke is not writing a church manual. He's not writing an exact description of what we should do. He's describing um, what happened. And therefore, we always need to be cautious when we begin to apply Luke's history to our own situations. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do that. It means we ought to be careful as we are, are doing that. Second thing I want to say is to look for what is normal in the book of Acts itself, okay? So when asking what should be normal in our churches today, I think the most simple place to start is to say, well, what was normal in all the churches described in the book of Acts? And what maybe differed within the book between church and to church, situation to situation. So, for example, in the first weeks following the outpouring of the Holy Spirit uh, on the day of Pentecost, the Jerusalem church shares all of their property in common with the wealthier members. They're selling their property and they're giving it to the apostles to provide for the needs of the poor. And, and some people have said, well, that's what Christians should always be doing. But if we look at the book of Acts itself, we don't see the example of other churches that are started in the book doing that same thing. That kind of radical devotion to God where they're selling all their property, that was kind of a unique thing that was happening during that transitional, or we might say, revival period of the church. And while the uh, example of that generosity in the Jerusalem church is a good example, it ought to 
to challenge us. It's not a mandate that ought to be enforced as if we say, okay, everybody who is rich in churches ought to be doing this if you're going to be a part of our church. On the other hand, um, throughout Acts, baptism follows repentance and faith. There is never a single instance that the apostles baptized someone before they believed, whether they were adults or, or children who are incapable of professing faith. Um, always in the book of Acts, we see people believing and then being baptized. So to me, that is something that is normal in the book of Acts, and it is normal in our own day as well. The third thing that I want to add is to think through three levels of application. Christians, of course, disagree on what applies today and what does not apply today, but um, I think one way to, to have a productive discussion about this is to think about these three levels of application. So there are some things, not just in the book of Acts, but in the entire Bible, that are not required at all, okay? So these are practices that we read about in the book of Acts, but they're not required at all for the church of, of today, because Acts was a unique period uh, where God was establishing the new covenant, bringing people into this for the first time, and so amazing supernatural things happened. I think that speaking in tongues falls under this category. It's not required of people today. I think, as I just mentioned, the selling of the property and giving it to the poor, that's not required of people today. Um, it, it, it's not a mandate that is put upon us. But there's a second level of application. That is things that are not required, but are good, okay? So there are practices in the book of Acts that they are good examples to us, but they aren't necessarily required of us. So um, one example is we see in the book of Acts where people believe and immediately they're baptized. So for example, the Ethiopian eunuch uh, believes the gospel. And he says, look, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip baptizes him right there on the road. Um, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people believe, and immediately they are baptized. I think this is an example of something that there is a wisdom to baptizing people immediately upon their profession of faith. And yet, it's not necessarily a mandate that you have to do it this way. So, if you believed on a Tuesday, but your church didn't fill the baptistry and baptize you until uh, two Sundays later, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, it's not required that you be immediately baptized, but there is a wisdom to it. So, uh, so it's not required, but it's good. And then finally, there are things that are required. There are things in the book of Acts and the Bible that absolutely, this is absolutely required. Um, I think baptism by immersion is one of those things because that's what the word baptism means. That's what all the examples of baptism uh, are that are given us in the New Testament. And, and baptism by sprinkling or other ways, it's just, it, it, there's no example of it. It's not what the word means. Um, and so there is one requirement. Um, obviously, faith in the gospel is one of these requirements. The, the apostles say you need to repent and believe in the gospel. That's a required thing. There's no sort of wiggle room in that. Now, if we take these different tips that I've given you, I think that is, we're still going to have debates over tongues, over baptism, over lots of different things, but it's going to give us a, a shared ground on which to have these debates and have them in a more productive and loving way.